Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt. We now turn to Song of Myself, passage number one. Now, of course, I'm, I'm going to point out at LearnStrong.net, my assumptions are that you have been following our talks with Walt as we are calling this journey through the uh, deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass, starting with the 24 poems of inscriptions, and then, of course, the 19 sections of starting from Pomenoc, You'll remember that our argument from the very beginning was that we're learning how, in some ways, to read Song of Myself by reading those earlier, some 50 or more discussions, and now we're ready, finally, for Song of Myself. The other assumption, of course, is that you have already been with us for that first introductory set of comments to Song of Myself, because there's a whole lot of that information I'm just not going to go over now. I'm going to jump right into the poem. And sounding a little bit like uh, Walt Whitman himself doing a little bit of self-promotion, please forgive, but I've already given a full lecture on Song of Myself Passage 1 that's available for you in the descriptions box of this lecture. And if you haven't watched that lecture, I recommend that you watch that lecture because there's a number of things I'm not going to say in this lecture because I've already said it in that other lecture that was given a number of years ago. In fact, you could make the argument the genesis of this project in some ways, Talks with Walt, was born of that lecture where students afterwards said, why don't you do that for all of the poems of Song of Myself? And that, of course, led to a conversation about all of the poems in Leaves of Grass because there is a certain organic, notice the title, Leaves of Grass, yes, there's a certain kind of organic understanding of Leaves of Grass. Once you start reading through all of the poems, and I welcome you now at the beginning of a new journey as we are on our way. Of course, Emer I'm using the very language that Emerson would use at the beginning of Whitman's journey when Emerson told Whitman, um, I, I welcome you, I and, and I'm pretty pleased at the beginning of a great journey. Let's go ahead now, turn specifically to the opening lines of Song of Myself. Now, I'm going to say this when I get to 3 uh, to three A and relations to other titles here in a bit. It is clear, at least to me, that Whitman, when he began his original 1855 Leaves of Grass with this poem, although obviously changed as we said in earlier lectures, it was as if he was trying to tap into the epic tradition. And what is it that one does if one is an epic writer, Homer, Virgil, and we'll look at the opening lines in a bit of those poems, well, you do, you do this thing we call the invocation of the muse. And I think that we are very much invoking the muse when we open with, I celebrate myself and sing myself. And what I assume, you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loathe and invite my soul. I lean and loathe at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now 37 years old, in perfect health, began hoping to cease not till death. Creeds and schools in abeyance, retiring back a while, sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten, I harbor for good or bad, I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check, with original energy. Now there's so much to say here, and obviously I've said a whole lot, of, as I said already in earlier lectures. I'll repeat some of that, but let's go ahead and go right to work. Notice, first of all, we begin with the pronoun I. Now, of course, T.S. Eliot will play a similar kind of game in its opposite direction as the first words, as we point out in our lectures at LearnStrong.net, for hollow men, we are the hollow men, we are the stuff men here, it's I, I, and then of course the key word, celebration. Now if you've been with us all the way from inscriptions 1 through 24 and the 19 sections of Pomenoc, you're not at all surprised by this because what is it that we saw in those titles over and over again? That exuberance, that celebration, and so here we are. Now of course the problem with this myself, it's here in the title, it's here in the first line, it's in twice in the first line, myself and sing myself. What is this myself? Well, as we pointed out, there's at least five Whitmans, 
Whitman as person, Whitman as poet, we've already commented on. Whitman as pedagogue, we're going to obviously expand on that by the time we get to 46, 47 and the destroy the teacher passage. Whitman as politician, his lover of democracy, his celebration of democracy. And then finally, Whitman as philosopher. That's just five of a whole bunch of other Whitmans that we're going to see. For example, many will ask, well, where do you put the sexual Whitman? And all of the questions about Whitman as, uh, you know, was he gay? Was he not gay? Was he celebrating the, the uh, homoerotic? What exactly, where do you put that? Well, we're going to qualify that, obviously, as Whitman as person to some degree. But then we're going to see his views of all different kinds of things are going to come in and out of all five, at least of those five perspectives. But think about it this way. There's at least three Whitmans, just like there's at least three you. There's a body. There's no question there's a mind, because you've got to have a mind to say you have no mind. But then there's that thing that stands behind the mind that somehow seems to be aware that the mind is thinking. I think a thought. I'm aware I'm thinking that thought. Well, obviously my mind is thinking the thought, so what is it that stands behind my mind that allows me to know that my mind is in fact working and I'm thinking that thought? Now, of course, you can call that whatever you want to call that. I mean, you know, the Greeks had a word for it in Psyche, and we'll talk about it in any number of ways. But we can talk about it when we speak Whitman with the word soul. So there's this very interesting thing of Whitman as body, Whitman as mind, and then there's this thing called soul, which is, you know, as we saw in Idolans, the poem from Inscriptions, something that's the all, omnis, is, is, is also his word. That is to say the all, and what is that about? He says, I celebrate myself... And, of course, the word sing. The word sing, using the word sing in the very first line of the great poem, Song of Myself, tells us he's in the epic tradition. But notice, as I say in my previous lecture on this, this can sound very narcissistic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a poem about myself, how amazing I am. But then the second line says, in what I notice it's assume, that is to say the fallible is positioned epistemologically. I think I'm right. I could be wrong, right? What I assume... You shall assume. Now, by the time you get to Song of Myself, if you've been reading every line of Leaves of Grass with us, the fact that he reaches out from the page and grabs the reader and says, hey, you, come here for a second, is not surprising at all. Of course, it was shocking in 1855 when they opened up the first page of Leaves of Grass and this is what they, hey, come here, come here for a second. In other words, there's an intimacy here. There's a one-to-one -one correlation in Dare We Say It. There's a celebration of democracy right away. We're all in this together. In other words, everything I'm going to celebrate about myself, you get to also celebrate about yourself. In other words, I'm not just lifting myself. I'm lifting the entire, shall we say it, human race. Readers of this poem become global very quickly after 1855. And he says it in the third line. For every atom, remember he's living in a time of great scientific exploration and immediately when we think of Adam, we think about our Thoreau and celebrations and, and Walden as we've given full lectures, as well as Emerson and all those amazing lectures especially uh, 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 that he gave and, and of course essays that he wrote, uh, especially nature. For every atom belonging to me is good belongs to you. We're all connected. The inclusivity, in other words, this is the dance. We've talked about it many times. This is the dance of Whitman. On the one hand, celebration of the individual. On the other hand, celebration of the group. And that dance between the two is truly profound. And then, several more eyes. Notice how many times I gets used in this poem, again, uh, 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 that anaphora, uh, that repetition of first, first words and lines. I loathe, it's a key word, it doesn't mean lazy as much as it means relaxing for Whitman. Attentive, but relaxed. I loathe and invite my soul. Here, of course, the use of the word soul, and this is the myself of the third that we were talking about. The invitation takes us back to inscriptions and starting from Pomenot. I lean and loathe, second time the word gets used, at my ease. Now, this is huge. In other words, he wants his poetry, the way Wordsworth will say it in the opening lines of Ten Turn Abbey's preface, I'm sorry, at the opening lines of Lyrical Ballad's preface, he wants there to be a certain kind of ease. In other words, this is not going to be hard, this is going to be something kind of easy, and then the next word, observation, observing. In other words, Whitman is a great observer, a great listener, I hear America singing, a great observer, and so he says, I'm going to observe 
A spear, now the fact that he uses spear of summer grass is fascinating. First of all, spear takes us to the Iliad. How many times did we say in our lectures over the Iliad the use of that word, right? Spear, summer grass, as opposed to what? Well, we've seen, obviously, in the earlier poems, the use of word grass a number of times. Curly grass, the grass the buffalo eat out on the plains. Here it's summer grass. In other words, the most beautiful grass, healthy grass, the, in the middle of summertime, right? And then he goes to his body. A very physical poet, this Whitman, as we'll point out, as we've already pointed out. And I have already said this in earlier lectures, Pushkin's prophet has to, I think, be considered as being a contemporary of Whitman. It's an amazing fact that a, the greatest Russian poet and the greatest American poet both will play the game of this thing of the power of the tongue as it relates to logos or the word. My tongue, and then he comes back to Adams again, every atom of my blood, and then he'll talk about legacy, formed from this soil, amazing. Like I said, he rarely uses the word America. He rarely uses that word because it's so sacred to him. Here, notice it's just this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same, legacy. And what is it that we pick up Virgil's Aeneid right away that we start to, uh, to have impressed on us? The power of legacy. We're going to hear early on in the Aeneid how Aeneas has a legacy. He's got family, and that's, a, that's significant. Um, in some ways, Whitman is assuming all of the major you know, holy trinity of epics, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid here. Notice we're going on a journey. We definitely are singing about war. We're going to hear that in a bit. And, and this whole thing of legacy, I mean, what, what is the point in Aeneid 6 of going into the underworld to, sit, to, to, um, to take the journey to meet his father, obviously, right? I, now, 37 years old, which is going to make this fascinating reading by the end of his life and, uh, you know, in his death, the 26th of March, 1892. He's born in May, dies in March. He's, a, he's always been the subject of spring and summer. And so he says, I now 37, oh, in perfect health. Now, this thing about health and perfection of health, we're going to come back to it again and again, especially in Song of the Open Road. The, the tragedy, of course, is that Whitman struggled with health much of his life, certainly after this time. But we will point out, as I say in that earlier lecture that I hope you've watched, it takes Whitman almost 40 years before he decides what it is he's going to do. That's an amazing thing. Biographers continue to struggle to understand how this person in total obscurity can come out of nowhere right before the age of 40, right upon the same time that his father passes away, his father who he has this really disturbing relationship with, and all of a sudden he produces this amazing poem called Song of Myself, not at the time, but later called Song of Myself. Hoping is a key word. Longing, hoping, expectation, to cease not till death, and as we've pointed out, he kept his promise. He kept coming back, editing, 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 and working. And of course, the lines to follow were not in the original 1855 edition, as we said in an earlier lecture. Now he's going to go with, with, with religion and education right away. Creeds, religion, and schools, obviously education, in abeyance. Now this word abeyance means to set by. Now immediately, the moment we see these two juxtaposed, we can't help but think of the Odyssey and Odysseus standing there with all that gore on top of him at the end of the poem. And he has, of course, a priest and a poet in front of him and he lops off the head of the priest and he keeps the poet alive to tell his story. Notice here we've got some similar kinds of juxtapositions between religion and education. I'm going to take everything I've known from before and I'm going to set it aside, suspend it for just a bit. He uses the word retiring back, which is interesting because he is the poet of progress and evolution, think our Darwin. But now he says, I'm going to take some of those other ideas and I'm going to hold those back. This is, of course, the Wilberian idea of transcend and include. We move forward taking a little bit of what we have from our past. Notice it's a while, retiring back a while. Sufficed at what they are, this word suffice, go back and look, for example, at a poem like Frost's Fire and Ice. I think that ice will suffice. It's, it, it's an interesting use of that word for frost, and here it is. Sufficed at what they are. Notice it's not what they were. That's key, right? In other words, he's not getting rid of everything that he has learned, but never forgotten, and that's a key, obviously, the whole notion he only sent is to forget will be a, a very Whitman-esque idea. I harbor is a fun word because, of course, it plays the game of where uh, in New England, obviously, we see harbors all the time. I harbor meaning I hold. For good or bad. 
Now this immediately, and this is why we read before. I mean, if you haven't read starting from Pamana, and you haven't remembered that, or, or haven't read that passage 7, remember what he says? I make the poem of evil also. I commemorate that part also. I am myself just as much evil as good, and my nation is, and I say there is in fact no evil, or if there is, I say it's just as important to you, to the land, or to me, as anything else. Why did we read starting from Pomenach? So that we could read Song of Myself. Why did we read Passage 7? So that we can look at a line like this and go, oh yeah, he's already said this. He set us up for this. I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak. Notice here it's not sing. Isn't that interesting? He's going to see singing and speaking is similar. At every hazard. In other words, this is going to be a this won't be a push, but it's okay. We're going to be fine. And it's going to be hazardous. It's going to be a little bit dangerous, a little bit edgy. And of course, Song of Myself, a number of times the manuscript was thrown in the fire by readers who considered it obscene, pornographic, hazardous, right? And then the word nature is the final line will set us up, obviously, with our Emerson and our Thoreau, and we'll join Whitman as the great a trinity of transcendentalists, along with obviously probably the greatest poet of them all, Emily Dickinson. Nature without check. In other words, wherever it takes me, that's where I'm going. With, and then of course, the last two words of the heart of Leaves of Grass, in my estimation, original. Whitman knew it was an original. We, got, we, we are so far transcending and going beyond, for example, a poet like Longfellow. We mentioned Longfellow's uh, Psalm of Life and the kind of rhythms that are there. And then that final word, energy. That which can be neither created nor destroyed. And of course, if it can't be created or destroyed, it must not exist. Oh no, it definitely exists. Leaves of Grass is about energy. And the majestic question of why it is that we're all here, or as Whitman will ask in, the, or, or, uh, um, in, in earlier poems, why is there something instead of nothing? Like, what is going on? Well, that's so amazing. Or as he'll say it later, in song to myself, to glance with an eye or show a bean in its pod confounds the learning of all time. It is a true mystery. To finish, of course, at 2A, we're all connected, and at 2B, the repetitions here, the rhythms, did you hear those speech rhythms that are so powerful? I want to spend a few moments, though, really quickly with you at 3A. Just listen to the opening lines of some of the epics that we've already studied and given full lectures on at LearnStrong.net. Opening lines of the Iliad. Rage, goddess, sing the rage of Peleus' son Achilles, murderous, doomed, that cost the Achaeans countless losses, hurling down to the house of dead so many sturdy souls, great fighter souls, but made their bodies carry on feasts for the dogs and birds. And the will of Zeus was moving towards its end. Notice the opening line of, and by the way, I'm reading, of course, our Fables uh, translation because it's so amazing, majestic, we might say. How about this for the opening lines of the Odyssey? Sing to me of the man, Muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time again off course, once he had plundered the hollow heights of Troy. Singing, of course, the second time. How about the opening lines of Virgil's Aeneid? We mentioned it a moment ago. Wars and the man I sing. Now, of course, it's the most obvious referencing here in terms of Whitman. An exile driven on by fate. He was the first to flee the coast of Troy, destined to reach Lavinian shores and Italian soil. Yet many blows he took on land and sea from the gods above. Thanks to cruel Juno's relentless rage and many losses he bore in battle too. And, of course, I mean, it's uh, obvious. It's obvious that, Do that Whitman is playing the game. Hey, how about this one? Opening lines of, how about our Dante? Midway on our life's journey, I found myself in dark woods. The right road lost. To tell about those wood woods is hard, so tangled and rough and savage that thinking of it now I feel the old fear stirring the Robert Penske genius uh, translation. And then finally, because he's been with us the whole time and we keep mentioning him, so let's just remind ourselves of the opening lines of Paradise Lost in Milton. Of man's first disobedience of the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oro of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning, how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or of Sion Hill, that delight thee more, Shiloh's brook that flowed past the oracle of God. I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song. Hazardous is the word that, of course, that is going to be used by Whitman. That with no middle flight intends to soar above the Ionian mount, while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. It will be, of course, Milton, I believe, who will give Whitman the license to say, I can do what nobody else has ever done. The final questions at 3B are these. Do you celebrate yourself? 
And are you ready for the journey, for the odyssey that is Song of Myself? Come back for part two in Talks with Walt. Thank you.